Bring in a few more pieces. <laughs> okay, let's get started. <clears throat> so thank you all for coming out on this cold Friday afternoon. Uh, we started this week off with an excellent protein design talk by Tanya Corteme. And today we get to wrap up the week with more exciting work also coming from UCSF with Bill. Uh, so today's lecture is uh, the David E. Green uh, Lecture in Enzyme Chemistry. This is sponsored by David Green Memorial Fund. Uh, David Green was a faculty member here in the Department of Biochemistry at UW-Madison and became the founding director for the Institute for Enzyme Research in the late 40s. Uh, during his 30 plus year career here at UW-Madison, his uh, research group made substantial contributions to our understanding of the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. And uh, this work really helped establish our department's legacy in enzymology and metabolism. <clears throat> uh, and today's uh, green lecturer is Bill DeGrotto, visiting us from UCSF. Uh, Professor DeGrotto received his PhD from the University of Chicago where he worked with Emil Kaiser on peptide design and synthesis. He started his career in industry where he spent 15 years at the DuPont Merck Pharmaceutical Company. Uh, he was on the biochemistry faculty at University of Pennsylvania and a few years back he moved to UCSF. Uh, Bill has very broad interests in peptide and protein structure, function and design. He's made major contributions to peptide therapeutics and our understanding of membrane transport proteins, uh, such as the influenza M2 proton channel. Uh, I'm most familiar with his pioneering work in de novo protein design. Over the last several years, his group has been designing not just structures, but actual functional biomolecules. And this work really tests our understanding protein function and lays the foundation for designing proteins with tailored <coughs> properties. Uh, Bill is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and recently received the Stein and Moore Award from the Protein Society. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor DeGrotto. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. There's lots of seats here, guys. Um, and, um, and for a really stimulating day, I've just enjoyed meeting so many people uh, today, and uh, especially the, the new young uh, faculty hires. It's, it's really exciting to be here. Um, so what I'd like to do, well, and also I'm, I'm very honored to, to receive, uh, to uh, give this lecture, the Green Lecture, and um, a little, uh, intimidated because when I started my career, I, I thought we should be able to design proteins entirely from first principles that were as active as enzymes if we really understood uh, the, uh, the basis of, of protein structure. And uh, at that time, we were starting to think we understood it because we could solve crystal structures and do mutagenesis and, and ruin the proteins and uh, say, okay, now we understand that, that glutamate's really important. Uh, but if we really understand, we really should be able to start from first principles and design things that are uh, as, as complex as, as natural proteins. And first getting to, um, to just simply fold was a great uh, challenge. And now I think we're right on the door, knocking on the door of being able to really make them bind complex molecules and the cofactors we need for catalysis. And I think it's really going to be in the next decade that we achieve the ability to design catalysts that are very efficient. And it's, it's really gratifying uh, seeing uh, so many people in the field uh, working now. So um, I thought I'd give you a little sort of historical perspective of what it was like to try to start designing proteins and then uh, focus uh, the, the talk on metalloproteins uh, with the hope that that will give us some focus. And uh, we'll talk both water and uh, membrane-soluble uh, metalloproteins, and how we design them and what they do. So when we started thinking about uh, uh, pro designing proteins, uh, people were very quick to tell me that this is impossible. How could you possibly do this? And the kind of arguments um, that, that they would make 
uh, would be, for example, you'd have to go think about uh, how are you going to go through 20 to 100 different sequences. That's more than the atoms in the universe. If you uh, mutate at a femtosecond time scale, so molecular vibrational time scale, in the time of the universe, you're not going to come anywhere near to, uh, 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 to this, this number. So, so how are you going to find the right one? There is a confirmational problem in the, with astronomical uh, questions, uh, again, about how can you ever find a, a, a native uh, structure. So uh, basically, those seem to me uh, to be sort of vitalist uh, arguments, you know, and I, I'd say, okay, then you believe in the great force, right, that, that created everything, and um, intelligent design, et cetera, and they'd say, well, no, not really. So then how did it work? Um, I think basically what, what happened early in the evolution of proteins was that you got uh, peptides that could self-assemble, uh, often it probably originally to amyloid-like structures, and then uh, these can, can uh, uh, we get gene duplication, allow things to uh, assemble into single chains, and we can create asymmetry. And uh, so uh, if that's the case, we really should be able to design uh, proteins in a build-up strategy, starting with peptides, allowing them to assemble, building sites, and so forth. And so that's, that's kind of the approach we took early on. Um, and the question is, what's going to stabilize our, our peptides to make something like a helical bundle or whatever? And uh, what we, we hypothesized at that early stage was it was just hydrophobic periodicity. You could take a peptide with the same amino acid composition, change the sequence, and if they are arranged to, to stabilize a helix, then when they bound to an interface or self-associated, uh, they would make a helix. And if they had a different order, then they would make beta sheets. And uh, in fact, we found that to be the case on some model peptides. So uh, arranging these peptides now to make every other residue, uh, they would, uh, or with a helical periodicity, they assembled into something that we thought were helical bundles. And when they were every other residue, they made something that we thought uh, turned out to be a cross beta structure. Now, going fast forwarding uh, to the to, uh, sort of current times, there's been a lot of thought more recently that, that a lot of the, um, uh, the again, the, the first precursors to modern proteins were amyloids and then uh, that they got stitched together in solenoid-like structures. And you can see uh, residual uh, remnants of those type of very regular structures, say in this carbonic anhydrase, it's a zinc-dependent enzyme uh, from uh, archaeal uh, bacterium uh, shown here. And uh, the arguments for an early uh, uh, evolution is that uh, short peptides that form amyloids can have many different conformational forms. And these conformations are self-replicating and self-purifying. So you can have a mix of things and only uh, one conformation and one sequence will come out. So to test this um, with Ivan Karendovich, uh, initially when he was in the lab and then uh, most of this work is since he, he's been an independent and, and he's been carrying this forward. Uh, we, we made a peptide, just a heptapeptide with histidines on one side, hydrophobic residues on the other side, uh, and after, uh, we, I think we screened four peptides to reach this sequence here, uh, so certainly not large computational design project. And yet uh, this peptide, when it binds zinc, has this hydrolytic activity. We're looking at uh, nitrophenylesterase activity. Uh, this is a, a function of substrate concentration. We see no activity whatsoever uh, for the zinc ion or for the peptide alone, but when we mix them together, uh, we have robust uh, uh, saturable activity just from a little peptide. Um, and in fact, that activity, at least on a weight basis, beats anything uh, that had ever been done in de novo protein design of metalloesterases. Uh, so um, it, it shows that, that it, it's a fairly substantial uh, rate and contribution. So uh, we solved the uh, structure uh, by solids NMR uh, with Mei Hong recently. And uh, this, uh, it assembles in pretty much the way we had anticipated. We have zinc ions that are tetrahedrally coordinated with the last um, uh, ligand being water, uh, more about that in a minute. 
uh, the hydrophobic sides of the peptides associate, and then they make uh, this overall assembly shown here. Now, what was interesting about this uh, is that we're seeing a new form of stabilization of amyloid. And uh, sparagine and glutamine zippers had already been known for many years from David Eisenberg's and others' uh, work. And it was also known that metal ions can stabilize amyloid. Uh, and this is uh, the first example now. We can see how the strands are all stabilized by uh, this amyloid structure shown here. Um, and and we're, we're interested in this for, for a number of reasons. First. It's been known for some time uh, that, that amyloid-forming peptides uh, can be uh, um, triggered to form amyloid by metal ions. You can imagine if you have parallel uh, peptides, it takes uh, the uh, um, res residues that are, are able to chelate or, or ligate and puts them all in register to one another in closed space, so metal ions can now uh, bridge between the chains. And it's also known that uh, metal ions also contribute to some of the toxicity uh, of amyloids. Uh, in terms of uh, applications for catalysis, um, you can see here we've activated water molecules in this array. And I think that's the basis for the hydrolytic activity. Uh, Karendovich has also shown that these can uh, catalyze copper catalyzed reactions. And I really think there's quite a bit one could do with these amyloids and metals in a combinatorial manner uh, for catalysis. Finally, I think this is a new type of material. Uh, it's sort of like uh, uh, metal organic frameworks, except it's peptide organic uh, frameworks. So again, I wanted to make sure I, I called out Ivan, who's really been pushing this work uh, forward in, in recent years, and Mei Hong's uh, group for solving the structure. So let's, let's think again about how uh, we, we came about designing helical bundles. We did this in a more or less iterative fashion, making peptides assembled, and then building loops, and then single chain uh, four helix bundles. The types of principles, it's, we're always testing principles and are designing things was first that uh, hydrophobic effect was going to drive this. Uh, we had to have uh, really tight packing of the side chains, uh, electrostatic uh, interactions, and then uh, propensities to adopt different conformations. So we made these, and we were almost, uh, they were almost native, but they had uh, sort of molten interiors, and we never could solve the structure. And one of, oh, Christ, excuse me. Excuse me, sorry. Okay. That's weird. So something that, that uh, really made life easy uh, was the uh, invention of repacking algorithms. Already uh, back in 1978, Michael Levitt had found that amino acids have sort of uh, quantized rotomers or conformations. And Ponders and Richards had shown that you can now search through sequence and rotomer space to find combinations that filled uh, sequence uh, the structural uh, cores efficiently. Desjardins and Handel first put it to use in protein design, and one of the first really uh, de novo uh, uh, applications were from uh, Dayot and Mayo, who made a zincless uh, finger. And um, with that, we were able to proceed much more rapidly in de novo design, and the first things that were done were uh, more or less coiled coils. This is one anti-parallel structure that we solved with David Eisenberg. Kim, Harbury, and Albert solved uh, many structures and repacked cores and showed how that the packing really dictated the stoichiometry and topology of the structures. Uh, moving to globular proteins, we were able to make three helix bundles that folded in a very nice 
uh, manner, and these were the first globular proteins that were genetically encoded and solved. Um, and we were able to make domain swap dimers and uh, hexamers and uh, ultimately molecules that assembled around carbon nanotubes and templated gold particles, buckyballs, uh, et cetera, in the nano world. Um, and uh, the, uh, and, and uh, David Baker came along and just really had dominant contributions in this area of de novo protein design uh, through his uh, application both of, of Rosetta and uh, his training of, of many, many people, uh, terrific people. And uh, so I, at this point, I think we can safely say it's, it's possible to design small single domain proteins of a variety of different uh, topologies. And the biggest question for us as designers is what is the question? Uh, what are the things that we want to accomplish? Uh, what are the functions that we want to build in? And uh, we, so I sat down with Mike Therian at some point and he said, you know, Bill, it's nice that you can make these proteins, but let's look at a real protein that does something important. And so this is, uh, in photosynthesis, the uh, protein uh, that shines light and reduces oxygen. Um, and it's really complex, as you saw. I just cut it back to the, just the, the business part and got rid of the antenna, and it still is really complex, right? Let's look in at the cofactors it holds together uh, to do this amazing job. And what we find are you know, uh, porphyrin-like uh, structures here. We have quinones. We have an oxygen evolving complex. We have things that can form radicals. It's remarkably complex. And um, what it does is, of course, you shine light. You separate a hole and electron. And this charge separation ultimately is what uh, generates uh, the power. Now, we would like it really, though, to be very simple. And uh, we'd like it, we think of things under control of evolution. We want it to be like the statue of Darwin, right? Uh, very simple, very elegant, very functional. Instead, what we see nature has handed us is this god awful music man, right? And. <laughs> Uh, so, but it also suggests a modular approach where maybe, you know, we could start by trying to uh, design a drum, right? Uh, so here's a drum, maybe we could deal with that. Uh, maybe we could make something that binds quinones, maybe we could stabilize a radical, maybe we could make a multi-nuclear complex here. And so I'll, I'll show you in the next few minutes our uh, uh, progress towards that. Uh, putting it all together, of course, is going to be the great challenge. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about how we design membrane proteins as we uh, move along. So let's start with our little uh, drum, or our little uh, multinuclear center here. How do we design uh, proteins that bind multiple metal ions together uh, for oxygen binding and activation? Uh, we've made a little progress. Uh, over the years, and this goes back to some really early work that we did in which we started, we became fascinated, as, uh, as Brian has, uh, in, in these dye iron proteins. Uh, is, is this your structure? Probably. Anyway, um, but uh, basically what we see is they're highly complex proteins, but uh, deeply embedded into the, in them are uh, these very simple helical bundles, and we can really uh, describe the structure uh, to about an angstrom RMSD uh, using very simple equations. So this is just a coiled coil approximation, and uh, that then suggests that it has symmetry. We have a glutamate from each of the helices, hydrophobic residues to make uh, the structure fold, and then a little more detail is needed. Um, so. Here, this is the structure we first designed with glutamates to bind the metals, both bridging and, and chelating. Uh, then we added histidines to just one side, leaving another side for oxygen and substrates to approach. And uh, what's going to hold it there? Well, we needed to have second shell ligands, uh, so hydrogen bond networks. And uh, we can build them here. We could also build second shells here. 
And all of this done with uh, simple sidechain repacking algorithms. And then finally, we have to extend the helices enough um, that we can now build hydrophobic residues here and here that are well packed and allow the structure uh, to fold. And so, and then the outside is just basically polar things. We solved the crystallographic structure, and indeed what we found was that we bound the cofactor precisely as expected. We have this very large network of hydrogen bonded structures. We also solved the structure without metal ions, and what we found was that hydrogen bond network was completely retained in the APO form. So it's all pre-organized, waiting to bind the metal in a very specific geometry. And uh, you can also now design these uh, helical hydrogen bond networks in Rosetta, and there's modules to allow that to happen. Um, now, what does the protein do? So the first uh, reaction that we were able to, to show is similar to an alternative oxidase in which we take an amino uh, phenol and it gets oxidized in a two electron process uh, to, uh, so from diferous to diferic. And uh, we found it, it followed michaelis menten kinetics and really uh, KCAT on KM was getting uh, within a couple orders of magnitude of what we see for very simple enzymes such as alternative oxidase. Now what you can see here looking into the active site is that there's two irons, one here and one here, and so it's uh, very good for uh, symmetrical two electron processes. But what happens if we block axis and change the energetics by making this here, now we've added a histidine, you can't even see one of those irons, and what happens now is that we can focus our chemistry on one of the two uh, irons. It makes a, when we add oxygen, it makes a peroxo group here, and then that can react directly on an aniline. So we have a completely different type of chemistry going on, hydroxylate and then further a two electro, another two electron uh, uh, reduction, uh, regenerating the iron two. So in all, we have a four electron process, and uh, we, we uh, both designed and, and analyze this in collaboration with Ed Solomon, uh, a, a theoretician and spectroscopist, and that's been published. Now, to move further, we would really like to be able to build four metal ions uh, that it would be redox active, and uh, so then they can deliver each one of these one electron as uh, we move to uh, thinking about things where we take oxygen, I mean water, and oxidize it to O2. And uh, so as a, a step in this direction, uh, what, what we uh, decided to do is to bind uh, uh, tetranuclear zinc at this site, uh, which would be easy uh, for us to characterize by NMR and X-ray spectroscopy. And um, so what we, we did was, again, uh, built second shell hydrogen bonds. Uh, we have four histidines, four uh, carboxylates as the ligands. Uh, we organize everything uh, such that uh, the, the helices, when, in, or when the uh, side chains are the appropriate rotomers and bind uh, uh, appropriately in a geometric sense, uh, this, uh, are well packed. And, so, and then it's, it's simply the same process that we've gone through over the years of side chain repacking and uh, building the structure up. So let's just look at the crystal structure uh, because it came out so very close uh, to the structure that we had designed and it really shows, uh, I think, a new level of mastery of, of being able to design highly complex uh, metal environments. So we have uh, layers of hydrophobic residues that provide the driving force to really push all these highly polar residues close together in the right geometry to bind uh, to the metal ions. Let's look at the site close up. And uh, what we can see is we have you know, the four carboxylates, uh, some, uh, and then we have two bridging water molecules in addition, and that's really important because ultimately we'd like to be able to take protons on and off. And um, we finally have plenty of second and third shell hydrogen bonds. Um, 
So here's, you can see the cuboidal-like arrangement, and here's the bridging water uh, receiving additional hydrogen bonds. And uh, now you can see the, that we built second shell and third shell interactions uh, in large uh, hydrogen bonded networks uh, that really are critical to holding this whole thing together. Okay. So that's about where we are. Uh, it would be great to be able to get manganese centers in here and really start pushing this towards functional chemistry. Uh, let's look at some of the other things that we can do. For example, can we bind quinones and stabilize radicals? Um, and here, uh, the, the challenge uh, that we, we set ourselves on was to take a catechol, and a catechol will go to the quinone form via a very, very high energy, unstable intermediate, which is called a semiquinone, and it's a radical form. And the question we said is, can we bind this so tightly into our protein uh, that we would stabilize and that would become the dominant species? And so what we did uh, was, uh, first of all, um, we switched from redox active metals to dizinc, and then we knew that the um, binding of the hydrophobic residues in a cavity, which we have here, would drive the, the uh, affinity, so we're gonna use the dehydration free energy and packing free energy to drive the stability of the semiquinone, which then could uh, bind uh, very tightly because it's a good chelator. And so indeed, uh, we were able to do this and we were able to stabilize the semiquinone by a minimum of uh, 10 uh, to the sixth fold. So that's many kcals per mole. And uh, that became the dominant uh, species, and it's been published. I won't go through all the data, but uh, uh, we made a, this uh, protein that can stabilize a radical uh, for many, many weeks in solution. So now let's think about um, how are we going to deal with uh, binding proteins that bind to porphyrin cofactors uh, with redox active metals. And um, so we, we uh, started again to design uh, uh, helical bundles uh, that bind to porphyrins. And this really is, is, is a major uh, 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 difficulty because when we move away from simple metal ions, uh, we're really uh, thinking about the uh, problem of binding ligands, organic ligands, uh, are, that can, can associate uh, with a protein. And we really need to be able to achieve sub-angstrom accuracy. And um, it, this is a major unsolved problem in de novo protein design. Now, to be sure, uh, for the last decades, there have been many, many proteins designed. This was originally uh, work we did in, in uh, collaboration with Les Dutton, and he's continued along these lines as of many others. And there's uh, literally hundreds of papers on proteins in which uh, cofactors have been non-covalently assembled or uh, tethered into helical bundles uh, called maquettes. And, uh, but there are no crystal structures and no NMR structures for these in the reconstituted state, and that's because they have highly molten interiors. And so it's sort of like a, a hydrophobic dye binding to a very nonspecific environment. And yet it's been possible to achieve a modulation of midpoint potentials and O2, so very simple O2-dependent chemistries. So, but if we really want to push beyond this to doing a useful catalysis, we're, we're going to have to be able to design things that really adopt one single uh, uh, structure. Okay. And that then brings us to uh, a major unsolved problem in de novo protein design, which is uh, can we make things that, uh, from first principles that really design uh, that, that bind to ligands? 
And the only work in this area uh, where we, there, we've seen some success comes from Baker's lab, and that's usually uh, after trying many, many different scaffolds, they can find some that binds a hydrophobic ligand, and then using yeast display, they can tune it up to make it high affinity. But uh, just being able to go in and make something, show that it binds, solving the structure, showing it's exactly what you have, had not been accomplished yet. So uh, what's the problem? Well, first, uh, when we think about designing the protein, we usually think just about this region here around the binding site. And yet, we know that proteins really finish their folding only when the pro with ligand binds. That is that you build in repulsion between a lot of the, the residues that are going to bind here in the bound state, which becomes, uh, let's say, uh, relaxed when the ligand binds. So you might have a lot of dynamics here ligand binds, and then we finish the folding process for the protein. That's how I like to think of it. Um, and then the other thing that we tend to lack and we're working on, I, and I, I won't speak about today, but we're making a lot of progress, is the cooperativity of the binding. So once you bind one uh, uh, ligand, uh, let's say make one interaction here, it polarizes the system so that the second one can be more favorable. We know this about hydrogen bond formation for, for many years. And so uh, we have to start thinking about the cooperativity of the whole process. But again, that'll be uh, the next time I give a talk. Now, um, so how do we rethink this whole problem with this uh, sort of insight uh, into uh, designing a protein that would bind a porphyrin, a metalloporphyrin such as this. And uh, the way we've always taken it, uh, approached it, was in some ways uh, sort of uh, inspired by antibodies. Uh, so that you think you've got these variable loops, you're going to vary the sequence so that you can bind something. Uh, and uh, pretty much the same thinking has permeated de novo protein design. We've got a core, we worked hard to make this core, or nature worked hard to make the core, and then we're going to rebuild a binding site inside what we call a scaffold. And uh, yet we know that in antibodies, uh, we have the process of somatic mutations whereby residues that are way down here can, can uh, uh, contribute to the binding of something way up here. Uh, we'd like to think of it in terms of allosteric networks uh, these days. Um, and so it's well known that things really very far away um, contribute to binding affinity. And so you have to think of this whole process of designing a protein to bind a ligand as a unified process in which the folding is very tightly coupled uh, to the ligand binding. And if we do that, we think we're going to succeed. So uh, we took as our, our goal binding this uh, very electron deficient uh, zinc tetraphenyl porphyrin with a highly uh, ruffled structure. And uh, we chose this uh, because of its optical and electrical uh, properties uh, of interest uh, to Mike Therrien at Duke and uh, said, can we uh, design something that binds this? Okay. So how do we do that? Well, first we have to have, um, we said, well, let's have one metal ligand interaction. That's going to help us position this helix. And then let's have, I, I mentioned second shell interactions as being very important. So uh, we have a, a, a threonine that we're going to build here as a second shell ligand. And this really uh, is, we've done in previous work uh, where we're trying to build four helix bundles. Um, that bind uh, porphyrins. The other two helices, initially, we can just place them as symmetrical replicates of these, uh, but lacking uh, the ligand and, and so forth. And so that's the original positioning of them. And then that creates an uh, overall structure and a series of folds so we can create a large ensemble. And then we treat the process of repacking of this to create, go from here to one with uh, side chains that have been repacked in this uh, uh, center is a, a unified problem. So uh, while we're trying to maximize the interactions with the porphyrin, we're also trying to repack this core. 
And we do this with flexible backbone design using Rosetta. Uh, um, Tanya Kurtemi was here and she probably just uh, said more about the uh, back rub and, and approaches for flexible protein design, but it allows the protein to breathe and uh, uh, change its conformation during uh, uh, iterative cycles of design and repacking. And so at the end, we have a sequence and um, oh, there's one more thing that I think was crucial is that we avoided uh, putting a large number of hydrophobic amino acids to pack against the porphyrin. Instead, we had backbone interactions uh, uh, between the C-alpha-H and the porphyrin ring uh, and uh, glycines in this region as well. And the reason I, I think that's important is if we add a lot of hydrophobic residues, the whole thing could collapse in the APO state and uh, become uh, much too uh, nonspecific in terms of its geometry. So we designed this and we made one sequence. Uh, we, so we didn't make large numbers, we just made one. And uh, this is the uh, solution NMR spectrum that we got. Here's the proton dimension, here's the N15 dimension. When you see this large number, uh, this large dispersion in the chemical shifts, immediately tells us that we have a very nicely natively folded protein. Each amide is in a unique environment. And we also saw a very good spectrum though, uh, the less uh, dispersion to be sure, uh, for the APO, so we were able to solve both the APO structure and the HOLO structure. And these are the, the structures shown here. So the, uh, the HOLO structure uh, is, uh, has the protein bound in it. That should say, um, I don't know what's happened here. Anyway, there's uh, the, when we bind the heme, we basically have uh, uh, very well um, structured uh, protein. And in the APO state, we see that this uh, region down here at the core is really well structured, but it's more uh, dynamic up here. Uh, we can do, um, uh, we found that there were two conformations. One is closed in the APO state and one is open in the APO state. And we think that possibly that motion is really important to allow the cofactor to come in. Once it comes in, snap, it's, it's shut. It never lets it go. Um, and the, the protein has been soluble uh, for over a year now uh, in solution. Uh, despite the fact that that cofactor has low nanomolar, if any, uh, solubility. So it keeps it in solution, never lets go. Okay, so how did we do in terms of uh, the accuracy with which we can uh, design something? It's about 0.8 angstroms in the uh, binding site relative to the design. And so it's extremely, uh, uh, it's on the order of a, a less than a single bond. Uh, so. I think we're really uh, getting there. We can really specify exactly what we want to happen. Okay, so what did we learn? Um, I think explicit design of both the folded core at the same time that you're designing the binding site is a, a major step forward if we're trying to design ligand binding proteins. We have to treat this as a unified problem. Um, if we don't, I like to think of it as dominoes, right? Each one is influencing the other. We take one out, we separate the problem, and now we've completely dissociated what's happening here from here. You've lost that influence. Um, secondly, um, what we found was um, we, we had something that was flexible enough to allow the, the porphyrin to come in but once it was there, it holds on to it forever. Uh, we uh, can boil the protein at 100 degrees. If we look at the spectra, they're uh, entirely identical, uh, showing that it it's, uh, maintains the porphyrin in the same environment and is, remains folded. Okay. And I think the field of cofactor binding proteins really is now positioned to progress in a much more predictable and high throughput manner. Okay. Now, the last thing that we just got, I got data from 
my uh, postdoc uh, or a graduate student is uh, shown here, and so I don't have any explanation for it. But uh, when we, <laughs> but she's really excited, right? Uh, uh, and so when we first uh, cloned and expressed uh, uh, this, we call it Gator, the protein, we found this little teeny bump at the, um, the, the, the Soray band suggesting that it had just a teeny, teeny amount of heme that was incorporated from the E. coli. It was, and if we went through it, it was about 0.05% uh, incorporation. But we then said, well, what if we tried to design this purposefully so that it would bind uh, to protoporphyrin 9 uh, iron in the cell? Would we be able to make a protein that really expressed, uh, that really uh, used that cofactor, could drive the biosynthetic machinery and load the, the heme? And uh, so the, again, it was a matter of repacking the structure. This time we have to stabilize a lot of polar uh, groups, uh, the propionates from the hemes. And indeed, uh, when we do this, the first uh, protein that we made, uh, when we break open the cells, uh, we find that it binds uh, to heme very, very tightly. And indeed, uh, since we had overexpressed the protein, the E, the e. coli were, were pink. And so uh, not only does it, this is the first example where, where somebody's been able to design a protein that really loads a, a natural cofactor without using like a covalent modification of C-type cytochrome. So it opens a door in the future to doing um, uh, in vitro evolution, to looking at a large number of um, different uh, types of, of um, uh, catalytic reactions. So I think it's going to be a lot of fun. OK. Now, let's go back to our theme, though, of putting things together and making them work in membranes. And uh, just give you a little overview of where we are in terms of being able to make uh, functional membrane proteins. When am I supposed to? How are we doing? It's, it goes to 4.30? Is it 10 minutes? OK, good. Um, so well, one, one project we, we've worked on is uh, asking ourselves, can we design a protein that will take a transition metals and cause them to go from one side of the bilayer uh, to the other uh, in response uh, to a proton gradient? or to go down a gradient and create a proton gradient. So can we make a transporter that uses ion gradients to drive another substance? Uh, so that's the question. Um, this concept's been around for a very long time, and uh, we see now many protein structures that show it. Uh, you have what's called alternating access. One side opens, closes off, and then something can go in. And that can be coupled. Uh, to a gradient, and this was first uh, predicted uh, uh, before I'm sure most of us were born in, in, in nature. This was uh, from Mitchell, uh, the, the, production, the, the idea of the alternating access mechanism, 1957. So why does nature want that? Well, you don't want to make just a channel, otherwise things will just diffuse through you dissipate the ionic gradient that you worked so hard to create that drives um, most of the processes of life. And whereas if you have a rocking mechanism like this, then uh, the channel is never open uh, entirely to make a, a channel. Instead, uh, it goes through discrete steps, and we can start to thermodynamically link binding of multiple factors uh, to the rocking uh, motion. So that's what we wanted to do, and, uh, but, but it, it required a large number of challenges. First of all, we had to de novo design a membrane protein to show its structure was right uh, by high resolution methods that had not been done before. Secondly, uh, if we want to bind zinc, as you've seen, we're really going to have to uh, hold on to these uh, metal ions. So we had a large number of, of charged residues that we had to stabilize within a membrane. And then uh, the, the next part was relatively easy, we thought, that you have to link proton binding to zinc uh, release. 
and again, if you can imagine if you, you um, pronate a ligand, it's going to not be a good ligand for, for zinc, so we didn't think that was too hard. And then we had to design an energy landscape, think about what could go wrong, and what we were worried about was a double occupancy of this structure in a symmetrical conformation, okay, uh, with, with exact symmetry, falling into a deep energy well, and so we have to destabilize that uh, as shown here. So going from there to the design of an actual protein sequence, um, we, we first, to make it easy, we said, let's just make a single peptide that can bind zinc, dizinc, either here or here, if it's an asymmetric conformation, and if it's a symmetric conformation, that can bind in both. And again, we have to destabilize this conformation relative to the other rocked conformations that are partially asymmetric. Uh, to achieve that, uh, uh, Gevor Gregorian uh, did the computational part of this uh, using a negative design algorithm in which we think about maximizing gaps rather than simply thinking about uh, maximizing stability. And any time we're thinking about designing and uh, moving towards enzyme-like structures, this is going to be increasingly uh, important. We don't want to stabilize one state. We want to get the right um, balance of stabilization of various states. So, uh, at a, and uh, they had developed uh, with Amy Keating algorithms to really uh, dial in energy gap in protein design. So what came out uh, through uh, this work is published now, so I, I won't go through the details of how we designed it, but what came out was uh, a very tightly packed helix-helix interface shown here and a very loosely packed helix-helix uh, and wider helix-helix interface shown here. And uh, so uh, what this allows is a rocking motion about the loose interface and very tight assembly about uh, the this dimer interface. And when we solved this structure crystallographically, what we found was that the dimer was precisely as, as designed, and, uh, but it had uh, dissociated in my cell, so we only saw the dimer. And so then that caused us to need to go and use solids NMR with Mei Hong again uh, to solve the, the structure of the overall tetramer in phospholipid bilayers. So we could show it made the tetramer. We could also get um, distance measurements between some of the helices and show that uh, the intact structure, although dynamic, was, was, was as designed. Now, um, the next thing was to look and see whether it, it actually worked. And so we look at the diffusion of zinc into vesicles. And as zinc goes in, protons should go out. That's pre so first we see zinc does go in, and concomitant with that, protons do diffuse outward in this experiment. And uh, the coupling is about two protons to a zinc. Um, we also could show that it actually drives zinc uh, up a concentration gradient, or protons up a concentration gradient if we allow zinc to come out. So uh, it was showing that the hallmarks of a transporter. Uh, we also were able to show um, that it was most impressive in terms of KCAT on KM um, if we looked at cobalt efflux uh, through the channel or influx through the channel. Again, uh, we have uh, the same KM for uh, uh, observed for zinc. Uh, or, or cobalt, uh, irrespective of whether we're measuring protons moving or the metal ion moving. So this clearly shows that they're linked processes. Okay, and um, finally, yeah, uh, what we're finding is, is a KCAT on KM, which is uh, within about a factor of 100 of uh, some of the natural uh, proton-linked uh, metal um, uh, transporters. So the next question we asked, though, is does it need to be this complex? Remember, we had two sites, one here, one here, and we placed the site right in the middle of the protein instead, 
and have a, a, a transport uh, pathway here. And one of the things we wanted to achieve was to have a hydrophobic gasket on either side. Uh, and again, it's still a, a single chain that can rock back and forth in different conformations. So we, we designed that and we made two versions, uh, one with an extension uh, from the, the membrane and the other being shorter. This is the one that actually we've had the best luck with in terms of structural characterization. Um, and we made two versions of it. One is water soluble, the other is membrane soluble. And by putting water solubilizing groups on the outside, our intention then uh, was uh, to be able to, to more easily characterize it uh, crystallographically. In membranes, we were pleased to see that perhaps due to the extension uh, that it, it formed a tetramer uh, in, in my, a density matched my cells. So that was good. Okay, and the crystallographic structure at high resolution um, of the water solubilized structure shows that indeed we have metal bound. It seems to be dynamically held in the center because we don't uh, see individual lobes of density. And the membrane structure is coming along. This is at about four angstroms resolution, but it was nice to see tetramers. Finally, we see that it's, um, <laughs> Oh, my. <laughs> um, anyway. <laughs> Good luck with your talk, Bill, it is what that said. But anyway, it does um, work uh, in terms of fluxing ions. <laughs> so, um, so basically, I, I think we're at the point where we, we can start to design native proteins uh, that bind cofactors. I think we have a lot of uh, ways to go to really get them to do exactly what we want to do for challenging reactions. In membranes, I think we can move things uh, in a purposeful manner. And, and I think the, the future's uh, really great uh, for protein design, uh, not just because of what we've done, but more importantly, what everybody else is doing in the area. And uh, so. Uh, thanking finally my coworkers for the last part. This was Nate Joe and uh, Gavor Gregorian, who uh, was a postdoc but uh, did this work while he was at Dartmouth uh, 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 as an independent faculty member and is now a, uh, a tenured professor there. And, okay, so, and, okay. I think I'm going to stop there because I'm out of time. <laughs> so, thanks. really thought a whole lot about that other than the obvious things that, you know, if you want to bind copper, you would want to put a lot of histidines there. Uh, in the proteins we've designed with both carboxylates and, and histidines follow uh, the Irving Williams series reasonably closely. I think if we're going to bind manganese, we really want to think about water and bridging water, and so we'll have to get into the nuances. Um, I've never been clear how much of the selectivity that we see in biological proteins uh, to have a, just one metal ion there is due to chaperones relative uh, to binding affinity. Maybe that's a solved problem, but I'm not sure. What do you think? Yeah. Okay. Okay.
Um, yeah, we've in every case always started with the simplifying symmetry just because it's sort of an evolutionary argument and it used to be that that really was a great help in protein design. Uh, now I think it's more that we think of it as a draft uh, and then go directly to more asymmetric structures. Uh, so the protein I just showed on the, that binds porphyrins, of course, lacks any symmetry, but it still has a primitive symmetry at, I don't know, uh, one and a half angstrom uh, RMSD, it's uh, D2 symmetric. But as soon as we start to think about uh, working on a substrate that's asymmetric, we can't be symmetric. <laughs> and so um, I'll always take as much symmetry as I think is necessary, or is consistent with function because it simplifies our understanding. And then rocking off of symmetry is uh, a well-known way for alternating access. I feel like I'm not, I'm just babbling though. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. So is, is, is de novo design, is it fundamentally harder to do that with beta proteins as opposed to alpha proteins? So beta proteins have, uh, the question is, can you do de novo design of beta proteins? And that was, a, a, you know, a, a really difficult problem uh, for years. And I know Brian Coleman, well, the, one of the first proteins that was ever designed was by um, Jane Richardson, and it was supposed to be a beta protein, and they just made amyloid uh, for a long time. Uh, Brian Coleman, I think, worked on this for 10, 15 years. Finally, um, uh, the, the Rosetta community, uh, just by thinking about principles, you know, what are the principles that are required, uh, we're able now to design beta barrels. So, and then alpha, Beta has been easy uh, from the early days. Tim barrels have been uh, done. Uh, so I think most of the, the, the uh, topologies have been done. I think it w if we go to all beta structures, you really got to be careful or else you'll end up with amyloid. So I think you really need to have a lot of negative design thinking. What's it going to take to end up with amyloid? Do we have enough polar things on the the uh, edges of the sheets, do we have prolines appropriately placed, and then I think we'll succeed. Yes, sir. Um, it looks like some of those milk transporters are, might be good enough to put into a bacteria, for example, and replace a milk transporter that's required in a bacteria. And if you did that, you might, it might be limiting in a sense. It might not support optimal growth, but then you could do an evolution experiment. You just grow the bacteria for some period of time and you could see how far away from um, you know, the ideal you really are. It might teach you something about Right, what you're right. Um, I, I think there are eminent scholars thinking about this. <laughs> He's working on it. <laughs> um, but uh, we, we made a very simple uh, attempt and didn't work much on it of putting loops between the helices so that we could uh, optimize it in vivo. And it was toxic. I, and one of the issues we've had with this is that it's a little leaky to protons. And the coupling of metal ion to proton flux is very good. But the tr uh, opposite coupling of proton to metal ion isn't very good. And But basically, the, the killer experiment here, I think, would will be to make a zinc transporter that has a low affinity uh, for detoxification, because zinc is toxic uh, to E. coli. There's ZIF uh, proteins in E. coli. Uh, these are transporters, two of them. So you could knock them out and then look at uh, uh, loss of toxicity. So that would something I should do sometime. Yeah. The complex and highly evolved um, photosynthetic center. Yes. I wonder if you've thought about maybe the most primitive and simplest catalyst, which might have been the, the dipeptides or tripeptides that, uh, that enabled condensation of amino acids. In other words, enable lengthening of amino acids. 
So the question is, have we thought about templated synthesis uh, or, of, or but, but dipeptide, the yeah. The chemistries that could emerge from dipeptides, tripeptides, yes. to form longer peptides and eventually, you know, your photochemic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But basically, we, we play with that a little bit. Uh, but uh, my, my uh, former postdoc, Ivan Karendovich, is uh, driving that uh, aspect of the work. And, but it's fun to, to think about. Yeah. Yes? Yes. Wait, fusing onto artificial membrane proteins. Uh, certainly have thought about it, and there's a lot of important questions you could ask. That has, uh, sort of at the maquette level, where we don't have structures, Les Dudden has done that, where he's put uh, hemes at various locations into the membrane, out of the membrane, and so forth. And it would be interesting to do it with some of these structures where I think they're quite uh, possible to get three-dimensional structures, and then look at how it affects first the midpoint potential, and then uh, transfer of electrons between centers. We're doing that, and it was a lot of fun protein design exercise to put multiple binding sites together, because the porphyrins have very different uh, topologies than the, the dimetal centers. Uh, so trying to go from one topology to the next was, was an interesting design challenge, and, and we're just getting structures of those. Um, but yep. <laughs> so many things to do. Yes? Um, we didn't want to have a whole bunch of hydrophobic residues because we were concerned about collapse, uh, that it would just make a, a collapse structure or that we would have a lack of uh, binding specificity, geometric specificity in the uh, native st or in the uh, reconstituted state. Um, and if you just have glycines, for example, along a helix, coming against the porphyrin ring, that's reasonably hydrophobic, right? And uh, gets the water out. And uh, it also provides flexibility, I think, in the uh, uh, porphyrin-free state. So it provides enough dynamics, I think, to allow things to come in. So these are the sort of the considerations we always go through in designing a protein, uh, thinking about every state, and then trying to optimize we don't always demonstrate that uh, everything that we put into it was necessary. <laughs> so I haven't done that experiment uh, to, to make it more hydro. Uh, the APO, we have the NMR structure, uh, and it's uh, got two conformations, open and closed. Uh, but we don't have crystal structures of these. We, had very, very soluble exteriors. Uh, so we had t way too many charge residues, I think. And they, they uh, resisted crystallization. So we're redesigning the outside so that we can crystallize them, because it's a pain to solve. It use, do, do NMR structures all the time. <laughs> It'd be nice to have both. That also allows us to see where water and other things are. OK, well, uh, let's thank our speaker one okay. last time. Thank you.